Gentlemen, <clears throat> and we are rolling. Um, so I hope everybody got the message that there will be homework if we ever have First Peter class again. <laughs> uh, I would suggest you bind the First Peter demons that are trying to keep us from God's heart. Okay, um, we are actually in Genesis 16, but I wanted to read a verse that I actually finished with last week, and it's in chapter 17, and it deals with Ishmael, and it deals with God's view. <clears throat> so if you'll turn to Genesis 17, and we'll just read verse 20 and 21. <clears throat> And this is God, again, uh, speaking to uh, Hagar, okay? And as for Ishmael, I have heard thee. Okay, so what, is, what, is, what does that mean? It means that the Lord has heard Hagar, right? Pertaining to her oppression. Behold, I have blessed him and will make him fruitful, and will multiply him exceedingly. Twelve princes shall he beget, and I will make him a great nation. But my covenant will I establish with Isaac, which Sarah shall bear unto thee at this set time in the next year. I'm sorry, that's uh, to Abraham in 17. 21 is where he's speaking to. So we'll get into that when we get into 17 and really see uh, a big part of that. But just off the cuff here, what that is declaring is that um, God um, knows that Ishmael, who has been alive in chapter 17 uh, for a while, um, is not is not the firstborn. Okay, so what we're going to hopefully get into tonight is a part that I've been kind of anxious to get into in a good way, <clears throat> um, because we're going to really uh, develop this thing about Sarah's um, oppression of Hagar. <clears throat> and uh, in doing that, it would be good for you to notice, because we're going to read scriptures from several different places also, it would be good for you to notice that God, let me say it like this, okay, let's see if you can catch this, that God is treating Hagar as if she were Israel. But he's not treating her as if she's going to have the firstborn. Okay. All right. That's important. Because what we found out so far is that in her oppression, she cried unto the Lord and the Lord delivered her. Amen? And what we're going to see is we're going to go to Exodus in some different places, and we're going to see that that's the same thing that happened to Israel coming out of Egypt. But they, just because God answered their cry does not mean they were the firstborn. Okay, that's, that's important, see. Because this whole study ultimately is all about what's the firstborn and what's not the firstborn. And, and Abraham has been on this journey of trying to figure that out. <clears throat> and... Um, I mean, almost till the moment of Genesis 22 does he figure it out, but at least by then, Isaac is a little older, and Isaac is ready to be with his father in, in the altar. Can I get a praise God? He's ready to be with the father in the altar. And um, Ishmael will, will never do that. Um, so... Let me just read, and then we're going to look at uh, some of these scriptures in Exodus and in other places. Um, and the Lord, uh, let's see. Uh, and the Lord said, Surely 
Um, this is out of Exodus 3, verse 7 through 9, so you can mark it down. Why don't I just read a little bit up here, and then you can find that place. Exodus 3, 7 through 9. So the Lord iterates uh, his promise to Ishmael. He makes it clear that it is a promise, which is not the same as the covenant made with Abram. It is quite noticeable that he left out all the negative things about Ishmael that could have been said, which we got in chapter 16. He shall be a wild man and all that kind of stuff. He, leave, he left it out here in uh, um, chapter 17. <clears throat> um, but they were added over in verse 12. Because those words were for Hagar to know her son would be that way because of Sarah and would be a thorn in the flesh to Israel because of the treatment Hagar received. <clears throat> All right, so it is a big deal to God if you oppress others. <clears throat> Just look at Exodus 3, 7 through 9 with Deuteronomy 26, 6 through 7. Here in Exodus, God speaks to Moses at the burning bush for the first time about this portion of the mission. And when I say this portion of the mission, um, he's talking about the deliverance of Israel. But when he barely starts his journey in that direction, God speaks about his mission in relationship to the firstborn. Say unto Pharaoh, let my firstborn basically come unto me in sacrifice. All right. So uh, Exodus 3, 7 through 9, dealing with uh, an Israel mentality instead of a firstborn mentality. And the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction, there's that word, of my people which are in Egypt and have heard their cry. All right. So how many of you from now on are going to look out for these things in the scripture where you see the word affliction and heard my cry. Okay, praise God, we got three. <laughs> well, it would be good because you can, you, what you're going to start discovering is this isn't applying to the firstborn. Why? Somebody tell me why these scriptures aren't doing it. Okay, this is good. We, I, we got the same two people. <laughs> Mallory? Okay, that's, that's good. Great. Because the firstborn gives himself in the affliction, and he does it in the spirit of the firstborn, which is Christ, and he, uh, and he sees it as an opportunity to be with the Lord rather than uh, a horrible thing that's going on that I need God to come deliver me from. Okay? All right. So, and have heard their cry by reason of their taskmasters. For I know their sorrows, and I am come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land unto a good land and a large, a land flowing with milk and honey. Now, <clears throat> it's interesting that in, um, in many of these cases, when God is hearing about affliction, he comes down. Yeah, yeah. And he always does that. He, he, he comes down to where you are instead of you coming to where he is. But it's interesting that God would come down. Okay, so we used these examples before. We used the example of he shows up there with Hagar, and he shows, uh, uh, and he shows up when... Uh, um, Sodom and Gomorrah are going to be destroyed. And he says, the reason why I'm here isn't just to destroy them, but I've heard their affliction, their cry over affliction, and I want to check them out to see if they need deliverance or if my firstborn son is there. Good stuff? Amen. Okay. So, so let's go back to um, verse 8. And I am come down to deliver them out of. See, that's a dead giveaway. 
okay, out of the hand of the Egyptians, and to bring them up out of that land unto a good land and a large, unto a land flowing with milk and honey, unto the place of the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Amorites and the Perizzites and the Hivites and the Jebusites. Okay, so he's saying, I'm bringing you to a good land. It's a good land. There's milk and honey there, and there's also all these, these ites, you know. There's all these guys. I'm bringing you to a good, unto the place. See, it's even in the same sentence. Um, and to bring them out, uh, up out of that land unto a good land and a large, unto a land flowing with milk and honey, unto the place of the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Amorites and the Perizzites and the Hivites. Do you see that? That's all one sentence. We only go, oh, I want God to take me to a land of milk and honey. You know, and that's the way we think. You know why? Because we've heard it so many times from teachers and whatever that that's the whole deal. Um, so someone could say, yeah, but he's also taken them there to drive them out of the land. Okay, well, heck yes. Excuse my Texan. But that's what he's, that's what he's, he's going to do. But guess what? If it was such a good land, those guys wouldn't even be in there. I'm thinking like a Christian now, excuse me. If it was such a good land, there wouldn't be these guys. But you know what? It's a perfect land. It's a good land. You got milk and honey. I mean, it'd be better if it's chocolate milk, but you got milk and honey, and you got, well, you got local honey. <laughs> and you got all, you got milk and honey. Let's see. And it's large. Okay, so that's three things. And then you got Canaanites. Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, and Hivites. You got way more problems in there than you got, you know. I'm just trying to, trying to show you our, our mentality is wrong so much of the time. We, we think that his only purpose is to bless Israel or to bless Christians, he said, as he did quotations around those words. But that's what that's his deal. That's that's what he wants to do. No, he wants. If you're Israel, he'd still like to try to form Christ out of you, the Lamb out of you. Did you know that? All is not lost. <laughs> but we kind of know the end of that deal. All right. So. Um, Verse 9, Now therefore, behold, the cry of the children of Israel has come unto me, and I have also seen the oppression, see there's that word, wherewith the Egyptians oppress them. I've seen the oppression wherewith the Egyptians oppress them. So, um, we're actually, well, I won't say it yet, because I do that a lot. I, I, I end up giving away everything early, and then when I get to the place where I read it, it's like, we know that, Randy. You already said it. We always look at this as representing the fact that God only came to help those of his own. But Hagar, in that sense, wasn't his own. No, he comes to help the oppressed. But you have to remember, there's two sides to that. He exalt, that's one sentence. He exalts that which humbles itself and humbles or brings down that which is, exalts itself. And if you're in the midst of that kind of a flow, then God can move. <clears throat> okay, so let's see it again. Deuteronomy 26, verse 6 through 8. Deuteronomy 
And the Egyptians evil entreated us and afflicted us and laid upon us hard bondage. All right. They evil treated us. Okay, they treated us in an evil manner. Okay. They afflicted us. And they laid on us hard bondage. And when, and when we cried unto the Lord God of our fathers, the Lord heard our voice and looked on our affliction and our labor, and there it is, and our oppression. And the Lord brought us forth out of Egypt with a mighty hand and with an outstretched arm and with great terribleness and with signs and with wonders. Okay, so who is this speaking here? Not, not, not the person, but who, what group? Huh? Israel. This is Israel speaking. How do you know that? Because, listen to it. it us, us, us. We. Our, our, our brought us with a mighty hand, with an outstretched arm, with great terribleness, and with signs and with wonders. Okay, so there's no mention of the cross. There's no mention of the altar. There's no mention, let's put it on this basis, there's no mention of the killing of the lamb. None. They don't even think of it. It's like, well, we ate that, and that was the lamb was just one more thing to deliver us, right? That's all it was. And now that they're delivered, it's a past event. It's a past event. Well, for the firstborn, it's their life. They ate that lamb. Everybody ate it, but they didn't digest it. Right? You see what I'm saying when I say they didn't digest it? You go, well, where's that in the scripture? Well, it's not. It's their actions. It's the way that they're, it's the thing that they're emphasizing as the answer. Okay? So, um, uh, in all these verses, we see a similar pattern. People are oppressed. They cry unto the Lord, and he hears. What does that mean when he hears? What's, what's, what in the in the Hebrew, what would it be the Hebrew word there? And and he Ishmael's. <laughs> See, that's hard for y'all, isn't it? That's hard, but it's the truth. See? Because he did that for Hagar, okay? <clears throat> Which pertains to God hearing Hagar's cries. The name Ishmael is not an evil name to God, the person may be, but the name was given by God in good faith to one who was afflicted, which we're talking about Hagar. Again, Ishmael mean God, means God hears the oppressed. All right. I have a subtitle here which denotes a change. <laughs> and that subtitle is, Woe to those who mistreat others. <clears throat> okay. Um, Verse 13, uh, again, it's, uh, and she called the name of the Lord that spake unto her, Thou God seest me. For she said, I have also here looked after him that seeth me. I'm still in 16, right? Yeah. Um, remember that in verse 11 she she uh, she is told to call Ishmael the God that hears this pertains to the fact that God heard Hagar's cry over Sarah's abuse and the predicament that it has brought her and her unborn child into but in verse 13 she gives God a name she gives God a name okay now I, I'm going to make some statements here, and it's and I, um, I fully expect you on a regular basis to not believe everything I say, but to check it out in the Word of God, 
be like the Bereans in Acts 17. They were more noble than they of Thessalonica, for they searched the scriptures daily to find out if the things they were being taught were of God. That's your responsibility, you know. And uh, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say some things that maybe you've never thought of here. I've already done that a bunch with Hagar, but she's, she's actually got one more up her sleeve here. <laughs> An amazing thing, actually. But in verse 13, she gives God a name. Thou, God, seest me. The first thing of note is that she identifies the angel who has been speaking to her as God himself. Do y'all remember early on, I, it said the angel of the Lord, and I said, well, that's veiled. We're not seeing him yet as he is, but before it's over with, we will, we will have him identified as God. Thou, God, that seest me. Um, Okay, she calls the name of the Lord that spake unto her. That's the scripture right there. All right, the second thing is more amazing than we fully realize at first glance. Would you be shocked if I told you that she and only she gives God a name? <laughs> God named her child and she named God. All right, let's, let's look at this, though. There's more to it. Um, Abram and others gave names. Well, okay. What do you think of that? I said, she's the only one that gave God a name. And your mind should have gone to at least Abram and said, well, he gave God names. And other people did. All right, so this is where I want you to check it out in the scriptures. Abram and others gave God names to the place where they encountered God. And though that name represented God, because in his mind that name represented God, it was given to a place. It was not directly tied to God like what she's doing. She names him while they are face to face. Okay, Abram, Jacob, and others name the place, or they call it after his name, and in some cases when God's already gone or not there. She looks at God and gives him a name. El Roy, R-O-I. Uh, but she calls him El Roy, the God who sees me. She means that he is the God who sees me in my affliction. She might think, I didn't pray. And yet God delivered, God did this thing. I was not worthy, but God did this thing. I was only harshly treated, I was, I was only harshly treated and he saw me when I cried to him. It's not even that he delivered me, for he didn't. He didn't deliver her. He just heard her cry and saw her. Okay, you tell me which one you'd rather have. Would you rather God just deliver you all the time, or would you like God to notice you and be there in, in spirit for you, even if you're not there, because Hagar wasn't? Um, so I wrote, it's not even that he delivered me, for he didn't. He sent me back into harsh treatment. But she is overwhelmed with the fact that God saw her and God heard her. That God even showed up. And, and not just showed up, but did all of that stuff. Remember all the things that happened? He sent me back into harsh treatment, but he took note gave a son, and through that son there would come many seed along, and I wrote, with righteous judgment. <clears throat> we'll explain that as we go. Okay. Verse 14. Do you notice we're moving right along? Wherefore the well was called the only word I can read out of that is beer. 
Bir lahai. Oh, I, I see the word hair in there now. Bir lahair oai. It is between Kadesh and Barad. She not only gave God a name, but she also named the well or fountain. Bless you. The well of him who liveth and seeth me. In verse 7, she calls it a fountain, but in verse 14, she calls it a well. How many of you notice that kind of stuff? You know, they're, they're important things. She tended to mark things uh, by wells or fountains, whereas Abraham did so by altars. Anybody see a difference between the mother of the Ishmaelites and Abraham? She marks it by, and just so you know, Along the way, we're really going to get into some contrasting of her with Abraham and their, their thing because Abraham is a firstborn and Ishmael and Hagar are not. They're not. All right. So to this point, Hagar has referred to God seeing her and taking note of her affliction in two different ways. The first was that she called God El Roi, the God who sees me. The second is she calls the fountain nearby, the well of him who liveth and seeth me. But by association, we can also say that he is a God who sees our oppression of others. So let's talk about that. In this specific situation of Sarah's hard treatment of Hagar, God sets forth future events that, are, that involve firstborns and supposed firstborns. All right, so now we're going to get into uh, the future. The future result of Sarah's actions. And I'm not sure how far yet we're going to really get into that. But before we get into the physical manifestations and um, the results in the right word, the, the, the reaping what you sowed, um, we need to do some more contrasting. We need to see, like, even though God is moving here in Hagar's life, and even though God is moving here by, by extension in Ishmael's life, God has not dealt with Sarah yet. I mean, you see all this, you see God showing up, you see God naming, you see God doing, you see God promising, you see all this stuff. You see God ministering on so many levels to Hagar, and, and again, by extension, Ishmael. But we haven't really yet seen the results. And to really understand the results, then, we have to look some more at this contrast of firstborn. Um, <clears throat> so let me read that sentence again. In this specific situation of Sarah's hard treatment of Hagar, God sets forth future events. In other words, he doesn't just stay in the here and now, He's, he's not, you know, for God now is always. You know, for us, we live in increments of time and space, and we try to move within the realm of those things and understand God, and that's ridiculous. We have to have the Holy Spirit not just as a charismatic king, that, that anoints us or gives us gifts or does all this kind of stuff in our setting down here. He's trying to, as it were, um, 
build the house, which is us. He's trying to make us into uh, that which Jesus died for. And to do that, he's going to have to explain in pictures and dealings for a while. But eventually, if we, if we get the picture, like Jesus spoke in parables or whatever, if we get the picture, if we get that picture, and, and uh, for example, looking at, at Hagar or, or how about um, coming out of Egypt and seeing the firstborn and then Israel. Well, how many, how many do you know have made that division, even seen that division? Well, everybody who sought the Lord that wanted beyond what's taught. And, and you say, well, I, I just want to know you, Lord. I just want, I want to know you the way you are, not the way I have formed you or the way Randy has formed you or the way anyone else has formed you. I want to know you. And I admit I don't know you at all. Because in, in the fullness of who he is, you know, we, for the most part, it's almost like we get rain from heaven, but we don't see the realities you know, we see the benefits usually. So, um, future events that involve firstborns and supposed firstborns. Oh, how important is that? We're going to see future events that come from this situation that involve firstborns and supposed firstborns. May the Spirit of God open our eyes. May He open our hearts because that's where that's, God dwells in relationship. God the Father dwells in relationship to firstborns. The Holy Spirit is dealing with firstborns and supposed firstborns. Right? All right. So, because of Sarah's harsh treatment, Hagar's seed... Hagar's seed will survive and grow into Ishmael, Ishmael the multitude. They're going to grow into Ishmael the multitude. Abraham's future seed will face new trials of affliction because of Sarah's afflicting of Hagar. Well, can, you, can you see that? Okay, so you have, you have Sarah and you have uh, Hagar here, and the affliction is going on against Hagar. Almost looked like a pair of glasses there for a minute. Um, and so uh, this affliction is going on. But God is telling her, you're pregnant, and, and you're going to give birth, and it's going to be a son, and I think I'll name him Ishmael. And so I, I probably should have drawn this, drawn this a little differently. Let's draw it like this, okay? You got Sarah here. Sorry, that's not a five. It's just this board is so fun. And you got Hagar down here, and you have what we would just call an event. But to God, it's not an event. It's our reality. It's our reality. And from that event, God sees what our reality is. So, what happens? The one that's higher attacks the lower one, the weaker one, and oppresses her. Doesn't just deal with her or da 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 da, or, but oppression. Oppression oppresses her. All right. So God comes along, and he, he already had promised Abraham. So Sarah, you see this long line? That's going into the future. That that's line is longer than Sarah's life. Right? All of the seed of Abram. Okay, guess what? God also promised Hagar and her seed 
would go forth also. Okay. So God is going to set forth future events. Long, let's just put Sarah dying right here and Hagar dying right here. I don't know at what point they died, but whatever it was. But, but Ishmael is continuing on in the multitude that was promised. Generation after generation after generation. Same with God's promised seed. Okay? So, that's what I'm trying to get at. Is that we need to see... Uh, what did I put it? Woe to those who mistreat others. <clears throat> um, And he sees our oppression of others. All right. Because of Sarah's harsh treatment, Hagar's seed will f survive and grow into Ishmael, the multitude. That's what I'm putting by this bottom arrow. Abraham's future seed will face new trials of affliction because of Sarah's afflicting, which means what? It means that here's Abraham's seed and here's Hagar's seed, and Hagar's seed, which is Ishmael, his hand is going to be against his brother. Well, the only brother he had when he was born, when, when Isaac was born, was Isaac. You remember these scriptures? This is all supposed to build until, we, until the, the scriptures turn into life around us. Okay? So... Then the oppression starts coming back up, except for it's, if you sow one seed, you usually don't get back one seed, right? Isn't that true? You get back many. Okay, so this thing can happen, who knows, along the way. All right. We should remember this anytime we mistreat others with words, attitudes, and actions. The things the Lord is about to bring about in relationship to Hagar's seed cannot be reversed. This cannot be reversed. It's the, the, the arrow has left the bow. Okay. God sees. God sees is his name. And Hagar named the place. She called the name of the uh, uh, name of the Lord that spake unto her, "Thou God seest me." All right. So it's not only that Sarah has left let fly with the the arrow. It's God showed up and and saw the whole thing. God saw it. Okay. Um. He saw Hagar and her affliction. What he sets in motion is not special care for Hagar in order to be relieved of suffering, but future retribution of Sarah's seed. God, okay, let's go back to Hagar. God didn't relieve her of the affliction of Sarah. That would have been the retribution. That would have been the end of it. You did this, Sarah, and I took her away from you and freed her, right? But he didn't. He sent her back. He sent her back. God's going to deal with this down the road. Do I sound like a madman? God's going to deal with this down the road. All right. So let's keep going because there's a bunch. <clears throat> I'm going to read that again. He saw Hagar in her affliction. Therefore, what he sets in motion is not special care for Hagar in order to be relieved of suffering or affliction or oppression, but future ret retribution on Sarah's seed. 
In other words, Abram's wife, by her simple actions and attitudes, set a negative course for the future of her own seed. Y'all enjoying that? <laughs> Let me just drink to that. All right, Galatians 4. Let's look at Galatians 4, verse 22. <clears throat> For it is written that Abraham had two sons, the one by a bondmaid, the other by a free woman. Now look at verse 29 through 30. But as then he that was born after the flesh persecuted him that was born after the spirit, even so it is now. Nevertheless, what saith the scripture? Cast out the bondwoman and her son, for the son of the bondwoman shall not be heir with the free woman. All right. So. This, this comes down the road now. This doesn't happen immediately. This happens when finally the seed shows up. And God's saying, you know, when he says cast out, he's not saying they disappear. He's saying that, they're gonna, that the new seed is going to keep going. The old one will keep going too. All right. So, I wrote, I want to come back to Sarah's treatment of Hagar and the far-reaching effects of it, but I think it best to finish the rest of the verses and then return to it. So we're not going to get quite into it. We're going to go into, and I wrote these things a long time ago, and I have not touched them up. <laughs> they are, you know, so I didn't even remember that I was going to, have to do this first. All right, so, gosh. You know what? I think I'm going to do all y'all a favor. Well, here's why. Um, I'm going to quit a little early, but here's why. The, the things that I have said, I'm going to go through the scripture and prove it out. Okay. And tonight has been a, a, big, a big gulp. 32 ounce. <laughs> big gulp. And, uh, you know, if it's a, like a 55-gallon thing I'm trying to give you a drink to, then you're going to drown. It's called waterboarding. <laughs> so uh, I'm going to um, I'm gonna stop. But the, the good thing is we're going to go ahead and what did I say? Am I going to finish out reaching back? But I tell the best to finish the rest of the verses and then return to it. Okay. So let's see. We got 15 and 16. Okay. Yeah, it's not going to be that big a deal. Um, we're going to finish out chapter 16, and there's not. There's only a few verses left. And then we will come back, and I, so I want you to try to, I mean, maybe just ask, one thing might work, just ask the Lord the meaning of this little simple chart of Sarah oppressing Hagar, and God sending, you know, I can put another arrow, this is a two-way street here, but it's not oppression, Sarah oppressing Hagar, but Hagar being sent back under the oppression to bear it in a in a proper spirit. So you have to remember that she did bear it in a proper spirit. We don't know how long or how much, but we we can show that she must have because of the results that are going to come 
down here in the future. If she didn't bear it in the right spirit, then there would be no repercussions. You know, what, what is it? Um, you're, you have your reward. You have your reward. So it's important now. This is real important because it, it is, you know, we're about to release these two lines from now all the way through the book of Revelation. And it would be good to understand why things are as they are. Because somebody keeps going, uh, you know, in politics or whatever, you know, well, uh, we're going we're gonna to settle the problems in the Middle East. Well, the problems in the Middle East aren't Middle East problems. They're spiritual things. So that's what we want to do. Father, we just thank you for your, your word and your heart and your desire to fellowship with us, to have us brought in to fellowship with you in the things that are yours. Not just have you teach us things down here in the earth, but have us brought up into fellowship. And then beyond fellowship, made partakers of these things. We long for that. You long more than we do. So we seek you. We ask you to make, write it on the fleshly tables of our heart. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, take a big break unless Kelly wants to come back early. <laughs>